Well, welcome everyone to our virtual field trip today. Uh, we are really excited to have you here. My name is Katie Carpenter. I'll serve as a host today, uh, just making the connections between the classroom and the farm. Uh, you're going to see a lot of really interesting things today. Uh, we at New York Agriculture in the Classroom work with teachers um, all across New York State and are really happy to partner with the New York Beef Council on this project. Uh, you're going to, hopefully you received your inquiry box beforehand that had a whole bunch of really interesting things that you are going to see on the farm today. Um, from our last field trip, Chrissy, um, our host farmer, she went through a lot of those things uh, in, in the first piece of the of the virtual field trip and I hope you'll be able to spot some of those things uh, that were in your box. You'll see them on the farm in action. You'll be able to figure out why they were in your box. So I am really pleased today to be able to introduce you Chrissy Claudio, who is part of Omara Beef Farm. Uh, she's going to introduce herself. She's going to give you some background on the farm. Uh, and we have quite an exciting agenda for you today. So um, welcome everyone. We're glad that you're here. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Chrissy. Chrissy, Claudio. Um, my husband, Omera Farm started their, oh, sorry, she, she wanted me to start over again. Sorry, I think they unmuted me now. Again, my name is Chrissy Claudio. Thanks for the intro, Katie. Um, my husband, Corey, my daughter, and I um, work here at Omera Farms. Omera Farms started their beef herd in 2005. And we joined the herd, or we joined the farm about two years ago. We are a commercial Black Angus operation. Um, we are in central New York, Madison County, Hubbardsville, and our cow calf herd is based out of the Endless Trails Farm over here in Hubbardsville, New York. Um, we are done calving for the year now. A little bit about Amera Farms Amera Farms grows barley, rye, green beans. We make our own hay, baleage corn and I'm sure there's some other things that they do the boss is probably going to be mad that I forgot but that's definitely not my area of expertise um, my husband daughter and I we take care of the cow calf herd we calved about 140 cows this year and then we back around um, our herd of yearlings um, so we do that in Sherburne as well you'll see behind us this is half of our herd they're a little uh suspicious of what's going on today hence why they're standing in the corner but we're still grazing this time of the year and like I said we are done calving um, our cows I graze about 175 to 200 days out of the year and uh, trying this time of the year I'm trying to get as many days continuing to graze as I can the cows enjoy it I enjoy it and it's a lot better than uh putting out hay for anybody, everybody. So if we sneak over here, I can show you some of the things that we have that we feed the cows typically. You ready, Kate, or Catherine? Um, so our cows eat grass as their forage right now. They eat dry hay in the winter time. And we have a free choice mineral that we have for them as well. I'll show you that if we can sneak over here. Any questions, Katie, or? Not yet, but I will okay. note, uh, so we had some questions that were sent in beforehand, uh, but remember, if any of you would like to ask questions, the way this works is that you can actually come right up to the screen, and that's how we know you have a question. Uh, we can do multiple questions at one time from one classroom, uh, so whenever you have a question, feel free to come right up to the screen uh, in front of the camera, and we will call on you. So here's a little sample of, we feed a free choice mineral. So the cows at any given time in their pasture have free access to eat as much of this, uh, this as they want. We use a commercial mineral that's designed for this area and for our type of cows. Um, we have a sweet feed for some of them, but our steers, they finish the last four to five months on barley. Um, this is just a little sample of a sweet feed for a cow. Um, you'll see Lucy later, it's our daughter's little calf. She enjoys that. And then this is just a sample of our dry hay. Um, we utilize dry hay 
and we use baleage as well during the winter and then we'll supplement the, the calves who are our smallest ones growing the fastest and have the biggest nutrient needs we'll supplement them with barley so um, a little bit about our tagging and our visual ids the cows are not being cooperative at the moment sorry they were all up here earlier but um all the moms have these orange tags each cow each cow has two visual IDs and they're orange. That's really important to us. It helps us track the history of the animal, any vaccines that we might have done, maybe if there was a withdrawal from an antibiotic. So identification for the animals is very important for us. And then the babies, like I said, they're not being cooperative right now. But all the boy, the bull calves from this year, they all have yellow tags and they have two, one in each ear. And then all the heifer calves, which is girl, means girl, have pink tags, one in each ear. So that way if they lose one, we always have a backup. And the moms actually have, it's called an 840 tag. It's, um, you can scan it with a scanner and then the cow has an individual 12 digit number. But um, identification of the animals is very important to us and helps us to make sure that we're following all the rules and regulations that we're supposed to and the history of the animals. Um, Chrissy, anything else, Katie, I'm forgetting? Chrissy, what's the purpose of the um, RFID tag? Um, why is it more um, beneficial to have than just a regular ear tag? Um, it's a smaller, it's a little button. It's about the size of a quarter. It is, we put a little farther in the cow's ear, a little farther back. Um, I know that and Catherine would know more about this than I would, but I know that New York State is going to start requiring that. So it's all about traceability. So when I take an animal to be processed, if something happened or there was something the matter, they could trace it back to my farm. Um, so that's something that they're suggesting that all the producers have. I don't believe it's 100% um, required yet, but it's something we've already transitioned into because we have had cows in the past, they rub on trees, or the feeders or each other and they'll break the backside of their visual tag and then once I you know if I lose two of them that don't have visual IDs then it's kind of a guessing game as to who is who so those buttons are just a little extra security for us here on the farm because that's very important to us here. Awesome thank you uh, could you also talk a little bit about the life cycle of your animals I know we have a lot of culinary students here so they might be wondering um, what uh, what that life cycle looks like from the time they're born until the time maybe they're working with that product in their culinary labs. Perfect thank you for the reminder I did forget that so we are a cow calf operation here we choose to calve from May until August and so this cow right here in front of us she's a three-year-old and I know that based off of her number um, so cow calf and then so we have the baby so the babies will then about 200 to 250 days of age we will wean them from their mother and then until spring and that's just how it works out in our farm until spring the background. So we'll give them some barley, some high quality baleage. Baleage has more protein and it's sweeter. The babies like that a lot better than the dry hay. And then when spring comes around and they're almost about a year old, then they'll go out and I guess we consider that a stalker. They'll go out and they'll graze for a whole year, spring to fall until the, the grass is gone and they'll just get to be babies. They'll run around, graze, get big and really develop that foundation, the bone structure for us to be able to put the pounds on at the end. So in, in the fall, they're gonna go to the feedlot. We choose to finish our animals on barley and high quality hay. A lot of different farmers do it a lot of different ways. There's two different options. I'm sure as most of the culinary students would know, grass fed and grass finished or grass fed and grain finish. So we would be the second grain finish since we do finish on barley. Um, little side note, our barley that we don't sell to like breweries and stuff is what we utilize as a feed to finish our animals on. We feel like it gives it a very good distinctive flavor and great marbling and the cows really enjoy it as well. And so typically they are at the feedlot for about, I would say 100 to 150 days. It all kind of depends on how each animal puts on the weight. We're trying to get them to gain three pounds a day there until they're finishing. So they would be 1,000 to 1,100 pounds alive 
when they go to the processor. So those are just our bull calves who we've castrated. So they're considered steers. And currently we don't finish any of our heifer calves. We keep all of our heifer calves to return to the herd at three years old and have their babies. So did I forget anything part of the life cycle, Katie? No, I think that sounds great. Um, can you talk about what makes beef cattle a little bit different than dairy cattle? So um, what makes beef cattle different, there's a couple different things that make beef cattle different than dairy cattle. Um, all cows produce milk for their offspring and obviously dairy cattle, they um, milk them to be able to use the milk. Here, obviously, well not obviously, but here, the, cat, the calves drink from the cows. They capture the milk and that's, we don't want it obviously, but um, I'm off base, sorry. The beef cattle are better suited to be outside. You wouldn't have very much luck with dairy cattle. They have thinner hides and need a little bit more nutrients and such, but the beef cattle have thick hides. They grow a really good coat. It's actually like too, it'll get like curly and thick on the bottom and really stringy. They're starting to get it. They look a little like unkept right now, but um, they're well suited to be outside. And like I said, commercial black Angus is what we do. I don't have a barn. I utilize different geographic locations on my farm, um, wind breaks, and then we really feed them well during the winter. Our cows do not get any grain. They just get dry hay or baleage. And so by, um, I guess you would equate it to keeping the oven warm. If we keep them well fed and plenty of food for them to choose constantly. It keeps the rumen working, which is like a little internal furnace for them. And so actually, if you drive by a herd of beef cows and they've got snow on their back, that's not melted. That's a good thing because that's showing that the cow's insulation, she's got enough fat and she's keeping her all that heat inside. You want to see that. So this one here is also, she's three years old and she gave us her first calf this year. Um, but I think those are the basic differences between dairy and beef cattle. Dairy cows come in a lot of fancier colors and spiffy patterns and um, beef cattle do come in. There's black Angus, red Angus, there's short horns. Herefords are very nice. They're the red ones with the white faces. You will see in our herd, we do have three um, bald faced cows. I think they're over there. Um, and that means they had some Hereford in, back in their lineage at some point. But um, I think those are the main differences. Did I miss any? I think that sounds great. Now, one of the questions that was sent in earlier by one of the teachers uh, was wondering about your market. Do you sell your beef locally? Does it stay local to restaurants or just um, the general consumer? Or does it go into um, the larger supermarkets? Yep. So that's a great question. Beef producers all have two options. They can sell to the commodity market, which would be like at a local auction or to places like a supermarket and stuff such and such. Sorry, we choose to direct market the majority of our meat. Our meat is sold in um, Manlius, New York at Side Hill Farmers. It's a craft butchery. And then a lot of it as well, we market through our guest house over here at Endless Trails Guest House in Hubbardsville, New York. So we get a lot of people that come, enjoy the farm. We border some state land. They bring their horses and ride. And I love to send them home with some of the beef that they saw being grown right here on the farm. Um, so the difference between Side Hill and the beef that I would sell, Side Hill Farmers dry ages their beef for 30 days. My beef is dry aged for 14 days, it hangs, and then it's vacuum sealed and frozen. Um, so that's how we sell our beef currently. And like I said, I think we had about 60 steers we finished last year, and this year should be about, be about 70, and will continue to grow. I'm not sure where it ends, you'll have to ask the boss that. <laughs> but um, yeah, we really feel like the barley that we finish our steers on gives them really good marbling and a distinctive flavor. And so far I haven't heard anybody complain about it. So did you want me to talk a little bit about grazing now? That'd be great. Okay, so this is my grazing stick. I work with NRCS in Madison County and Soil and Water. They're a great, um, place to reach out to if you have any questions about things and they're free, which is even better. I have a grazing plan. The, um, this year I grazed about 77 pairs. So a pair is a cow with a calf. I consider them like one unit. 
I have 180 acres and I grazed about 70 pairs this year on that. I have 20 different paddocks. And then I also use, there's, um, you might see the, I don't know if you can, but the little white post there, there's a piece of poly wire. So every day the cows get a new section of grass. And I try to plan ahead for each pasture to have 30 to 60 days of rest, depending on weather, precipitation, and how good my soil is. So like I said prior, I typically graze, I guess in a bad year would be 160 days and 200 days in a great year. So far we haven't gotten a lot of rain, which will change tonight, <laughs> but um, I'm grazing currently still. The longer I graze, better for the cows. And then hay costs money, as you know. So um, the less hay I have to feed, the less expensive it is to feed them over the winter. But um, yeah, I love grazing. It's always uh, funny. My husband and I joke, we're all excited in the spring to graze. And then by the end of the year of grazing, we're ready just to feed them hay. <laughs> but they're getting a little antsy lately. They think the grass is coming back farther or faster than it, it actually is. It's not. I don't think they realize winter is coming. But um, yeah, I take my stick, I walk around, and I measure the grass. And there's a little paper that I have from soil and water. And I try to estimate you know, based off of, I have an aerial shot of the whole farm, and it tells me how each, how high, or how many acres each paddock is, and so I try to guess how many pines, pounds of dry matter there is in each pasture, and that's how I plan how much they need for each section, and that, you know, I can feed them for the year, but each cow, or each unit, each pair, needs about 2.5% to 3.7 of to 3% of dry matter per day. So my cow pairs, I'm, I guess that my, cow, my cows average at 1,300 pounds, and then I add a 300 pounds for their calf. So it's all like guesstimates and your best educated guess. So for 1,600 pounds, I believe the last time I did it, my math was 40 pounds of dry matter per day. So I need 40 pounds of dry, powder, dry matter per day times 70. And that's how much they should be eating in dry matter per day. So, so Chrissy, um, we have up on the screen, we have your um, aerial image of the farm and yep. your different pastures. Yep, and this is pasture number one. This is a pasture that we've wintered in a few years, and then we tilled it last year and reseeded it with some rye and a, pra uh, and a pasture mix, and it came back very good. Um, we just tried not to we're really cognizant of what our animals do. Um, the manure, as much as people might think manure stinks and such, it's a free fertilizer. It's great for my grass, great for my soil. So by utilizing the temp vents, I confine them to an area. I make them, I think the last grazing talk I went to, they talked about frosted, fr frosted flakes and bran. So if I confine them, they don't just go eat all the frosted flakes. I make them eat all the stuff that they wouldn't necessarily be their first choice and I make them confine them and I uh, make them distribute their manure really well. So that helps me as I continue. If I don't have healthy soil, I can't have healthy animals because my soil is not going to grow that great to be able to feed them. And at the end of the day, healthy, happy animals um, make good product and cost me less money. So um, yeah, pet, this is pasture number one. Well, I think this is my fifth time grazing it this year. I think that was really interesting to see the aerial map, but um, also what jumped out is that there isn't a barn um, that we see. Um, one of the questions was asking about your um, habitat for your animals and what you do over the winter. How where, Do they go into a barn? Where do they go? What, what do you do over winter? So here at O'Mara Farms, we don't have any concrete and we don't have a barn. I probably would need enough concrete for like a Walmart sized parking lot <laughs> to be able to have enough space for everybody. So what we do is we uh, employ a couple different things and we always have plan A, B, C, and D as to what we're gonna do depending on what the weather does and what the cows need. So we utilize an exposed bedded pack, it's called. It's hay that we have that either got rained on or isn't quite the quality that we're happy with feeding them. So we take it and we chop it or we spread it out and make them a nice little pack. And they're really good. They're really good at telling us where they want to be. Like um, if Catherine goes over to the left-hand side with the trees, 
they, in this paddock, we've wintered here before, they love laying over there. The way the hay barn is and the trees block a lot of the wind and the snow. So if you watch, they'll tell you where they want to be. And so we, we have, in years past, done a bedded pack there. So as the, the bedding that they lay on and poop and kind of turn up by walking on, as it composts, it actually releases a little bit of heat. And so it keeps it, keeps it pretty warm. And they do really well. We just constantly... I overfeed them hay in the winter as well because um, they're going to waste a little bit by virtue of how they are and how we feed it out but at the end of the day I want to make sure that they have enough food so that their rumen's working keeping them warm and happy um, that's my most important thing but uh, yeah that definitely keeps me up at night wondering <laughs> how everybody's doing in the middle of the night and what the weather is like and uh, when you hear the wind howling uh, I know my cows are are smart and they bed down they lay and they group together in great ways. They're really amazing animals. So, so yeah. H HFM Bosies in Johnstown, they had a question after hearing about how much um, you're inputting into these animals. They were interested, how does your profit margins work? Are you going per animal, per pound? How does that work? <sighs> That's a complex question to really answer. We sell animals by the quarter halves and holes, and then we have also our retail cuts. So if culinary students know anything about how cows break down, there's prime value, or there's prime, um, prime cuts, chuck cuts, and well, prime choice and chuck cuts, and then you have your ground beef. So you, we kind of work it on the demand of our customers, and we know at the end of the day, our cost of production, and then we add into that um, Matt LaRue through the Cornell Cooperative Extension in, Catherine could maybe, in where? In Ithaca, has a great um, calculator for that. So when you input your cost of production and you play with the numbers and you input how much you wanna make into each animal, you wanna build your profit in to make sure that you're successful. Um, that's how we generated our retail cut list and our prices. Um, but we do have a quarter halves and holes and it's all about keeping records, knowing how much things cost, um, knowing how much hay I put out, price checking my vaccines through different places, and yeah, being very cognizant of the margins. That's the only way, and you know, dairy farmers will say it as well, because they have it, I think, a little harder than we do at the moment. Um, it's all about your margins, knowing how much you spend, and being smart. So I have Excel spreadsheets, I have Google Forms for any time I spend any money for the cows so that I can track it and make sure that I am making money. So we don't own the farm. We don't own Omera Farms. We work for Omera Farms. But if Omera Farms doesn't make money, we don't have a job. So at the end of the day, since we manage the herd, we want to ensure that Omera Farms makes money because we want to work for them for a long time. So we're going to head over here um, to our other side of our shoot. And we're going to talk about, are we doing weights again? Okay, let's head over here. And I think Dan had something to put up this time. And it was, this is a map of beef and dairy cattle production in uh, New York State. And this is kind of cows by the numbers um, or cattle by the numbers. So you can see that total, this black box up at the very top, um, we have close to 1.5 uh, million uh, cattle in New York State. Um, you start breaking that down by each of these sections, you can see some of the top producing counties. Um, we have schools that are coming from these regions today. Uh, so in Wyoming County, they definitely in Western New York, that top number of dairy cattle, 47,000, but the top beef cattle production uh, county is Steuben County with about 8,100 beef cattle just to that one county. Um, so there's quite a bit of cattle production going on, whether it's beef or dairy across New York State. That's interesting. We got to get Madison County's numbers up. <laughs> um, this is Lucy. Lucy was our last calf of the year last year. And um, her mom died when she was a week old. So she was a bottle calf of ours. And um, I think we were going to let everybody guess her weight. We just, um, I know ladies don't tell their weight. But uh, Lucy was uh, nice enough to get on the scale yesterday for us in our shoot, and we weighed her. So she is a little bit smaller than maybe, um, so she's a heifer, meaning that she's a girl. She's a yearling. She just turned a year old. 
So she's a little bit smaller because she was on, you know, I bottle fed her. I can't really compete with the, the cow's milk. It's really nice. <laughs> but um, I guess if everybody wanted, we were going to have everybody put their guesses in for her weight. Um, but yeah, we'll give it a minute. Just But Lucy is our daughter's show calf. That's why most of our cows are not halter broke and this comfortable with being loved on. But our daughter showed her at the Madison County Fair this year. And she has one more show next weekend. And then, um, yeah, she has some goats that she lives with. They're next door. Go ahead and put your guesses into the uh, chat. Oh, we have some specific numbers coming in. So Chrissy, while they're putting in their guesses, can you talk about why do you show animals or um, why is that important to your daughter? Um, our daughter is very active in 4-H. Um, showing cattle and bringing them to the fair, as much as it's fun, um, you don't ma actually make money at the end of it. <laughs> uh, maybe you break even or hope to, but it helps promote and advocate for farming and agriculture. And obviously being farmers and working for a large farm and being bee farmers, that's very important to us. Um, we encounter a lot of people that stay with us at the guest house who don't know much about agriculture, have no idea about beef cows, and believe in a lot of myths that really aren't that true. So that's something that we really enjoy. And we try to instill in our daughter as well. Right, this is my husband, Corey, sorry. <laughs> we try to instill that passion and advocacy into that with our daughter as well. So as much as um, I'm very proud when she walks her cap around and maybe gets a ribbon, um, it's more about spreading the word that agriculture is very important. We feed, we feed a lot of people. Um, well, I think Christine, one of the things so, I learned through the beef council that's really important is that we're making more beef than we ever have with less animals. That's something I've been learning and trying to advocate more as well. Well, our guesses have come in and it seems pretty unanimous. The schools think that C is the answer with some, some specific guesses of 526 pounds and 478 pounds. So Lucy weighs 285 pounds so she should be um typically when i wean my yearling they're more around 400 pounds so that's just because of the mom but lucy does weigh 285 pounds right now being a yearling um so she's a, like i said a little smaller than i would like her to be but bottle calves that's what you typically get so oh okay so Catherine had a question for me if she was um so our bull calves when they're about 200, about right before I wean them, we'll vaccinate them the first time, we will band them, and then we'll vaccinate them the second time as well. Once they're banded, they're considered steers. My steers, um, I, we finish them, they go to the, the, the processor, about two years of age, and I would like their weights to be, when they're alive, 1,000 to 1,100 pounds at two years of age, and they typically hang, so it's called hot carcass weight. They typically hang around 700 to 800. Maybe if they're a little older or one was a, a really good eater, 850. But that's, um, that's their hot carcass weight is what we average. So yeah, we're typically somewhere around two years of age. And like I said, we had about 60 animals that we, 60 steers last year that we processed. I think we'll be closer to 70 this year. And then, um, this year, we had 138 cows calved this year. Typically, I'm within one or two when it comes to count boys and girls. And this year, the bull calves way outnumbered the girls. I had like 80-something bull calves and 50 heifer calves, which is heifer is girl. And uh, I never typically get that big of a split. But um, yeah, we'll continue to expand and, um, as the markets tell us, have more steers to finish. So we wanted to talk a little bit about our shoot. This is our Pearson chute. Um, it does look like a big metal machine. It is really important, and it's a really big tool that we use. Um, did they get the, so Temple Grandin was a, um, she's a professor, I know as well, or a do, I think she has her doctorate, but she was a, a lady or a, a girl that was autistic and I think Katie can tell us a little bit more I'll let her do that because I don't want to say that wrong but this um, system really helps the animals stay calm stay safe as well as do the same thing for us 
So did you want to tell them a little, Katie, about Temple, and then we could walk Lucy through, or? Sure. That sounds okay. great. So Dr. Temple Grandin, you got a picture in your inquiry box of Dr. Temple Grandin with a quote about her philosophy on animal care. It was important for us to put that photo in there and hope maybe you uh, can do a little research on her afterwards, but you'll learn that um, she is autistic, um, and it's pretty... Uh, pretty exceptional that she was able to receive multiple degrees. Um, it was green. because her type of autism is that she can see in pictures. Green stuff. Um, any, any, if you say a word, she actually thinks of specific examples of that word. And so this really allowed her to think like animals and how they might feel. So for example, when she was in college, um, she figured out that she did not like humans touching her, um, but she did like the feeling of being, of having some sort of squeeze happening to her. Um, so she developed a machine um, where she would have two boards on either side because she grew up on her aunt's ranch in Arizona um, and saw the animals being squeezed and how it calmed them. So she created her own um, calming machine um, is what she called it, um, or squeeze machine. And um, she was able to use some of those concepts and learn about beef cattle and how they move and how they function uh, and was able to build, to really revolutionize the cattle industry by developing a shoot system like Chrissy has here. Yep, so this right here is called our crowd tub, and um, we're going to walk Lucy through it. This is not how it typically would go. She's going to take a little bit more time compared to the cows because uh, she's not done this a lot, but this is our crowd tub, so we would work the animals um, with our body language, and we have some like rattles, but they're really quiet, low stress, and we would walk, her, we would walk them up into our crowd tub, and then this door right here closes, and we push them in, not literally, <laughs> not like this, <laughs> but this is the alley, and then they'll walk down this alley, and then this right here is set for obviously bigger animals. This is a no back bar, so that would make it so once they're up, they can't come back, and it's all about, correct me if I'm wrong, Katie, smooth surfaces and seeing where they're going, so this machine really helps keep them safe, us safe, and them calm. We want low stress cattle handling. When they're stressed out, it doesn't work out very well for us. So I think Catherine's gonna come back around, but we have Lucy over here in the squeeze chute. It has a nice door right here. So once we get the animal in that we want, we close it. Has a fancy, this is our palp chamber is what we call it. So when our veterinarian comes at the end of the year um, to see how well of a job that the, the bulls have done to get everybody pregnant, he would go in here and we would open this and then they ultrasound them rectally. Um, there's two different ways to see if they're pregnant, either through palpation and ultrasound or we could take a blood test from her. But once she's in here, she did a really good job this time. This is a squeeze chute. So I pull this handle and I squeeze her and it helps her to calm down. Um, it soothes them a little bit. And then I have a vaccination door right here. So if she was getting vaccines, I would reach in and give it to her. We do all vaccines sub Q, we're a BQA farm. I would close this. Um, this also makes it so that it's really, well, we have our scale too. We can weigh her. And then these head gates, these are, you want to go around. This is a self-catch head gate. So she, when she comes through, it would be set backwards and then her shoulders coming through catch it. So this is a great and safe way for us to fix her ear tags. Um, we would do her topical pour on wormer here. Um, what else? We could check her teeth to see how old she is. You know, how if she's not in great condition, maybe she's lost some teeth. We want to check that here. These are all, this makes it so that I can take care of the cattle the way that they need to be taken care of. Um, they're not dairy cattle that are tied and used to me walking up and giving them a vaccine or something. So without this machine and then without this setup and all this low stress handling, I would not be able to take care of the cattle in a healthy, safe, and efficient way. So um, yeah, sometimes you can give them an oral medication here. This is really nice in our system. This is called a brisket bar. 
so that goes right up underneath her chest on their brisket and makes it so she can't fall down and get hurt um because some of them don't like it but it just makes it go smoother so when lucy's all done we would hit this bar right here this lever pops it back open for her so now she can move there's on both sides there is um, a way that if she got stuck or we had a problem I could open this up and let her out on both sides and actually this one too which is really helpful for me during calving season has these bars that I can take out so sometimes when a cow has had a calf she doesn't know how to mother it that well and I have to work on them nursing letting her nurse so that's really good or if they have a um, a hurt foot or such I can take care of that and it makes it safe for me I'm just gonna put this down because of course it's not going back and then when we're done we pull this bar open it up and Lucy's free to go and they typically just go back to our pen so did I miss anything Katie no I think that's great again remember you can put questions in anytime into the chat box um, or come up and we'll, we can call on you so I think you did a great job at showing that you um, put your animals through the shoot um, to check for pregnancy and also for general health care can you talk about um, one of the things they got in their box was a label from antibiotics um, yep. why would they get that so we use a couple different products and we brought some out just for people could could see. I believe they, the label that they got was for Draxin. Draxin's an antibiotic that works really well for respiratory diseases. Now, we are a BQA farm, like I said, Beef Quality Assurance. It's a program um, that we're a part of and I believe it's voluntary. I don't believe we're required, but it just educates the producers to make sure that we're making a product and growing a product that's safe for the consumers. So everybody got Draxin, and if they look at it, it has a table on it, making sure that I'm dosing them correctly for their weights. And then also, they're all labeled. It's gonna tell me my residue warnings. So it's gonna tell me um, I would get in trouble if I gave an animal a dose of this and sent it to slaughter, and then got tested and I got a positive for an antibiotic, the FDA would show up here at my farm <laughs> in black cars and suits and I would get in a lot of trouble and get thousands of dollars worth of fines. I don't want that and I don't want consumers to be worried about having antibiotics in beef. So so how do I so I, I, I know that there's not antibiotics in beef by adhering to my proper dosage and to my withdrawals and documenting it as well. So if I went out and I gave a black cow a shot of Draxin, and I didn't know there's 70 other cows out there that are black, and then one happened to get sick and I sent it without proper records, I could possibly be sending an animal that wouldn't be safe for consumption because of that antibiotic, not knowing when the withdrawal is done. So records, visual IDs, um, BQA, all very important things to ensure that our beef for our consumers is uh, safe. But I brought a couple examples. Cydectin is a pour on wormer that we use for the cows once a year. LA200 is um, great if they have foot rot or such. And obviously, none of this stuff, I, I, this is all, I have a VCPR, it's called a veterinary client patient relationship. Um, some of these are prescriptions, and I don't give anything to anybody without consulting with my veterinarian first. Um, Multimin is a vitamin that we give all of the calves when they're born and when we castrate them and wean them. It just has selenium and stuff. It's just vitamins that maybe our soil is deficient of. And I believe, yeah, there's no withdrawal on this one because it's just a vitamin. So is mucic, it's selenium and, um, and then banamine, but that does have a withdrawal. So records, very important. And here as producers, we have decided um, we do not use any growth implants or growth hormone or hormone implants. We don't implant anything. Um, it's just a decision. All farmers have decisions to make and that's something that we've choose, chosen to do depending on our markets and how we raise our animals. So did I miss it? Did anybody have any questions about that? I know that's a really big hot topic these days. I think it's really interesting to note that we talk a lot in the beef tours about 
um, how if you are a 16 year old girl and you go to the doctor and you're sick and you're a 45 year old middle-aged man and you go to the doctor and you're sick, you get the same dose of antibiotics. Is that true in animals? Does your um, heifers get the same um, dose of antibiotics as your steers? They do. It's all dependent for us on weight. So that's why it's important that we have a scale, we weigh them so that I'm not like guessing, you know, everybody, that was a great example with Lucy. Everybody thought Lucy was about 500 pounds and actually she was 280. So if I had dosed her, I could have over, you know, it's just very important. So yes, at least here, that's how it works. Um, the calves, it's all based off of weight. I have a question from Burnt Hills. How much antibiotics can you give cows and how young can you give it to them? Well, hi, Burnt Hills. I used to go to Burnt Hills. I, graduated, I, I went to Burnt Hills and then I ended up graduating from Galway a um, long time ago. I won't tell you how, how long ago. <laughs> um, so the question was, if I remember, because I, I, um, I talked, sorry. So how do I know I'm giving them the right amount? Was that the question? Well, how much can you give your oh. cattle and how young can you give it to them? If I had a calf that was born and possibly compromised, I could give a calf the day it's born antibiotics, but I wouldn't do that without a cause. With, you don't give antibiotics to a perfectly healthy animal. So I could give it to them when they were born. And then the other part of the question was how much or I, I would only give them how much based on their weight. So when calves are born here on the farm, we have a digital scale and we have a sling for them. So we pick um, to make sure that I'm being efficient to know which cows are my most efficient cows. So it's called average daily gain. Um, I want ABG. I want to know the weight of every calf born and I want to track that. And then I weigh them when they're weaned and I, um, figure out how many pounds per day that cow put on that calf. So by weighing them and know what, what they're weighing, if I had to give a, a brand new calf a vaccine, I know exactly how much it weighs. And then it's also making sure that I'm managing them well and giving them enough forage and food and stuff. So um, I think, I don't know if I answered that. I don't know if that was my best answer to the question so far, but we're gonna sneak over this way and walk in with the cows and take some more questions or maybe some other things that I might've forgotten, Katie. No, I think that's great. We do have some other questions here. Uh, so one of the questions is, uh, they're talking about animal behaviors. Can you give some examples of cattle behavior um, that you strive for or that you try to stray away from? Absolutely. So something that we noticed here um, when we first started is the cattle were very like scared of us and cautious. They definitely get very used to the people that take care of them day to day. Um, so they might be a little scared of Catherine, but if my husband or I were to walk through, they're very calm. That's very important. Um, animal behavior, we try to monitor how well each cow like takes care of their baby, how they react to us being in here. Um, there's like five different, but I would say like three very important reasons that we would cull a cow or an animal here. And number one would be temperament. They're 1,300 pounds. I'm not gonna tell you how much I weigh, but I'm certainly not 1,300 pounds. And if they're angry or badly behaved or aggressive, they're gonna hurt me. So temperament is one of the most important things that we watch their, for their behavior. Um, mothering is another very important factor to whether we keep cows and which cows we keep. Um, and obviously how they produce. So. I'm not gonna, it's not profitable for me. Somebody spoke of margins and profit. It's not gonna be profitable to me. The cow's job when she's here is to have a baby and take care of it well and behave good. Um, so if she doesn't give me a calf for a year, she might get away with that, but definitely at two years, that's why records are important too. If she hasn't given me a calf or doesn't get pregnant and I've done everything that I can, I've checked to make sure she's healthy, she has what she needs, you know, she has access to the bull to get, to get pregnant. Um, we use live cover, we don't artificially inseminate here. So definitely if she hasn't given me a calf in two years, um, we would get rid of her. But animal behavior is really important to us. They need to be calm. 
and when we're working with them calm. So by doing things routinely, they like a routine, it really helps their behavior. And then also we try to watch and how they react because when we work them and do different things, like if you walk at them in different areas, if I walked towards her shoulder, she'd move that way. But if I walked at her butt, she would move forward. So those kind, that's, oh, I just heard a beep. I'm not sure what that means. I hope everybody can hear me. Can no, you? you're good, you're good, Chrissy. Okay, sorry, technology. Um, but yeah, animal, animal behavior, um, them being conditioned to us and us being conditioned to what we should expect from them. So Chrissy, I think we probably have time for one more question. And this question is, is bee farming a career that's in high demand and how do students go to school for it or receive training? I would say, I don't know if I'm an expert on that. We found our boss through networking and through a mutual friend. Um, I'll be quite honest, I graduated from SUNY Morrisville with a bachelor's degree in equine reproduction. Um, animal husbandry is very, it's very similar, but there was a lot of different resources that I reached out to to expand my knowledge. Um, so there's a lot of different agricultural colleges that you could go to get training at and learn from in New York State, SUNY Colbo Skills, SUNY Morrisville, those are the ones that come to mind quickly. Um, but I'm not really sure that there's a huge demand for beef, um, beef farmer jobs. I think that there should be. <laughs> I think everybody should eat beef and know how it's raised, but I'm not sure that there's like a huge demand for it. I know a lot of people who raise beef privately, possibly like we do, um, are maybe considered hobby farmers. So they would have like 20 or 30 and typically have another full-time job. Um, but we're very fortunate to work for a company and have enough animals that between this and um, so we had we kept 140 this year but our total herd is somewhere around 450 right now and I don't think I've added the calves into that yet um, but uh, we're very fortunate that between the guest house and the cows this is our full-time job so find us on Instagram or Facebook too if you had any questions I forgot uh, is there a question from Canada Jahari or if not, you can. Well, it looks like that's probably all of our questions for today, Chrissy. We can't thank you enough for inviting us onto your farm and taking time out of your day to host um, all these students from across New York State. Uh, we appreciate your help and thank you to our students who participated uh, for such great questions and uh, we hope that you enjoyed our experience today. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Have a great day, everyone.